I want to wish you all a happy new year and welcome you to the 13th episode of Stefan Frank's photo book show. For those of you who are new to the series, uh, in this photo book series, Stefan looks at recent and not so recent photo books that you might or might not know about. And today's subject is Chung Chin Li, a captivating, captivating stillness. Um, beautiful uh, artwork that she does. I like her work very much. Stefan will, you, will tell you all about her. And I am Anya. For those of you who don't know of Strudel Media Live, we offer live online photography classes. Thank you for joining us today. I want to uh, briefly tell you about upcoming classes. Um, uh, Stefan will actually be teaching two classes and um, he has a new class coming up. It's called Things on Tables, an introduction to the conceptual still life. And it starts already next week on January 11. There are only a couple of spots left. Highly recommend uh, this new class to you. He will also teach a class on Gestalt theory, <clears throat> which starts in February. We have two new teachers that I want to welcome. Uh, one is uh, Helena Gonye from Spain. She lives in New York. And she will teach a class on using photos you made a long time ago to create new work. And that starts on February 4. And we also have a new teacher who will teach a history class. It will be um, history of European contemporary photography, and she will cover the years 1950 to 2000, and that starts in March, uh, and her name is Dortje Fink, and she lives in Germany. And we also have mini workshops coming up. One is this Sunday. Our mini workshops are one session only. They are only $39. And on Sunday, um, it will be a class uh, about Lightroom, how to organize your image archive in Lightroom. In case you want a refresher on that, or if you're new to it, um, you might want to take this one hour class. And uh, other classes that are coming up uh, in design for people who want to design their own photo books or zines. Um, we have feedback groups coming up. We have a class on the function of memory in photography coming up and also flash photography, many more. Go to our website, check out the classes page. And I also want to tell you about something brand new that uh, we will be offering soon. We will create live events where some of our students get to present their work in progress. And the first uh, such event will be on January 19th. And it will be moderated by our teacher, Alan Frame. I'm extremely excited about this, that he's doing that for us. Um, and three of his students will present work in progress. That will be January 19. We will send something out about that soon. Okay, so if you have questions while um, Stefan is presenting, uh, feel free to put them into the chat, or you can also unmute and just ask him directly. Um, Stefan's talk will be about one hour long, and um, yeah, Stefan, I want to thank you for another photo book uh, episode, photo book show. Uh, I'm very happy that you're doing this, and um, you may take over and get started. Thank you so much uh, to everybody for being here. Yeah, thank you, Anya, for having me. So, and a happy new year for me, uh, too, to all of you. I'm so happy that you all showed up here today for looking at the work of, um, I always have to uh, ask Edward how to spell her correctly, how to pronounce her correctly, Jun Jin Lee. Um, I've been to um, various Asian uh, countries in the, in the past couple of years. I've been to Myanmar and Vietnam. Uh, I've actually been to Japan and even South Korea. And the disclaimer here is, uh, starts with, uh, this here. So it starts with saying uh, that the more often I go to, um, I visit these Asian countries, the less I seem to understand that. Mm -hmm. So um, it becomes increasingly hard to to really find out what's going on, even if you have been there for, for a couple of, of times. And it um, this is something that I noticed when I, when I started with uh, preparing the slides for today. Um, that, of course, this talk will be extremely superficial. Uh, it will be only scratching the surface of uh, what um, Korean, South Korean art and the work of uh, Jun Lee actually is. Um, 
I stumbled upon this book by Roland Bart. Uh, he made a book on the empire of science. And this book is about um, Japan, uh, about Japan and about the uh, Japanese language. So although uh, this is will be extremely superficial because I have no idea what's going, uh, what's going on in Japan or in South Korea, uh, there is still a lot of value in doing this, not so far in actually understanding how people from uh, from Japan or from South Korea, how they work, how they uh, how they think. But it's actually very useful to understand your own limitations. When um, Bart talks about uh, Japanese as an unknown language, he talks about the idea that dealing with this language and with things that you do not understand about this language helps you uh, understanding your own limitations, helps you to find out how is my language built up and how does this language that I am using, how does it translate into my philosophy that I'm using? So how are the boundaries of the language that I am using? Um, how does it confine my way of thinking about the world? Um, of course, we are looking at the, um, at the language of photography here. And we are very used to conceptualizing photography as a universal language. So um, everybody can see, or most people can see, and there is um, no need to translate an image from one language to another. And the basic scene uh, we are dealing with today, or I was dealing when I looked at the uh, photography of Jun Jin Lee, was is it really true? Is it really so that we do not have to translate a, uh, a photo? So do they need to be translated? And I do not actually mean the text in there, but uh, I mean, how do we interpret the signs that are used there? And I was trying uh, today, I was trying to, uh, to deal with my own uh, fallacies of looking. And Let's start with some of the other fallacies. So this is was the first title that I sent to Anya. Um, this is Sen and the Art of Maintaining a Camera. And here was the first, uh, we uh, decided against this title, which I think was a very good idea because probably no one still knows this, uh, this book by Robert M. Pirzik about the art of ma uh, motorcycle maintenance. Of course, Zen will be part of this because it is part of the philosophy that uh, shaped uh, Jun Jin Yin's work. Um, so that was the first idea. I think the second idea here that um, Anna had is, is much better because it um, has this stillness that we that we get when we look at uh, when we look at her work. Um, after thinking about it and, and finishing the slide, I came up with this. I came up with uh, what I think is now the final title. It's Painting with Shadows. And this Painting with Shadows comes from the idea that um, the word photography literally means drawing with light. Um, the word was supposedly coined by a British scientist, Sir John Herschel in 1890, uh, 1839 from the Greek words, Phos, uh, from photos meaning light and graphe meaning drawing or writing. So, and this is the way we usually conceptualize photography. We're drawing with light, we're using, we're looking at light, how it works and how it plays out in an image. Um, it turns out that it was very close to not being called photography, but skiography. Uh, William Fox Talbot, uh, one of the pioneers of photography, actually the, the guy who invented the, um, the photo negatives, the idea that you have, um, that you do not produce a positive image, but you produce a negative image that you have to invert, uh, that you eventually have to invert again. Uh, he was hesitating between uh, photography and skiography. Uh, so he was into shadow painting. And of course, when you look at this, uh, his invention, so the invention of the, uh, the photo negative, which was a 
um, very at the at the beginning of photo books because this was the basis of being able to reproduce a photo uh, photograph. Um, you can immediately say why he thought about painting with shadows because the negative has a different distribution of shadow and light. It has the negative distribution of shadow and light. So he was also the first one who then went on to um, making the first photo book of this. So this is why I find it interesting to think to see that uh, at the beginning of the photo book stood the idea of painting with shadows. And these shadows, they are very uh, important in, uh, in, in Asian cultures. And there is uh, a very famous book by Junichiro Tanizaki in Praise of Shadows, where he talks endlessly about um, the importance of shadows for pretty much everything, for architecture, for um, building, for um, painting. And this is very different from uh, our conceptualization of architecture when we always look at how light enters a building. And um, Japanese and Korean um, houses are very much centered on the idea of shadows. Where do you have um, shadows and how does the house shelter you from the, from the light? So this negative positive switch is very important to to understanding the um the philosophy behind uh, behind the photography that we will be looking at um so the idea of having something that is positive and something that is negative is something that informs all of our photography and it is um interesting to look at how this changes from um the uh, the orient to the occident um so the other thing that you see here this uh this idea of negative and positive is the difference between figure and ground so this is the other part of this um when you go back to when you remember this negative uh that we just saw from uh william fox talbot um, these are interchangeable things. You ha cannot have a ground without a figure and you cannot have a figure without a ground. So positive and negative, they always need each other to exist. So, And for those of you who, had, uh, who were in the surrealism class, uh, you already know the dizziness of figure and ground and how it interchanges it, each other. Uh, that the figure is not the ground and the ground is not figure. So this kind of dizziness appears in serialism. Um, just to make some advertisement for a course that, uh, that we've just been doing there. So you already know that this dizziness, that this ground and figure uh, induces. Um, but... Of course, we will revisit this idea of figure and ground that you see here. When you focus on that, uh, when you focus on the figures, you sometimes see these uh, these statues, uh, these these pillars that you see here. And if you uh, look the other way, you see two bending um, female figures that bow against each other. So, figure and ground need each other to exist. And just to slip in some other advertisement, come into this, um, into this figure and ground relationship from an uh, in, in Gestalt theory for photographers, because this is a basic of our visual perception. Um, and of course, this differences between figure and ground, positive and negative, yin and yang, this is fundamental to uh, to Zen, and. Um, of course, this difference between positive and negative, it reappears on the uh, on the flag, on the uh, South Korean flag, where uh, red stands for positive and blue stands for negative. Um, but they appear in a way, um, in, a, in a different way from what we think about them in the um, 
in our cultures where we think positive is something positive and negative is something negative. It is not meant that way. It is just the opposites of things. So this is one source of uh, the of the photography of uh, of Jun Jin Lee. Um, the other source is when Bartz uh, talks about uh, Zen, the idea that you have a language that has word uh, that has concepts, um, a concept of knowing without a subject and without a known object. So the idea of perception without intention. Uh, this for us is really hard to understand because we lack the, uh, we quite literally lack the words for, for saying, for talking about this. So after positive and negative, uh, we come to another concept. So the other concept is a concept of uh, a gap uh, of ma, a gap, a space, a pause, the idea that not only the things that exist, but the things that do not exist um, have have meaning. So in um, Asian art, it, like in this um, panel, it is not only the figures that you see here that are important, but also the gaps between the figures are important. They are an important part of this artwork. This is why you have in uh, a lot of Japanese graphics, you see a lot of open space, a lot of empty space. Um, because the emptiness here, the gap, the pause between the things, uh, they have a life of their own. We sometimes have uh, in our way of, um, in, in Western photography, also have this concept. Like in this picture from Luc de la Haye, um, who was photographing at war scenes in Afghanistan. And he has a very curious way and a very interesting way of photographing the, uh, the things that happen in a war without actually photographing the things that happen in the war by being very far away from that and being very distant from that. So this, what you see here in the picture is the absence of conflict, but it's still present in the image. Keep that in mind because this will be important for a book that we will be looking in a minute. So this idea of knowledge without knowing subject and without known object, uh, that is part of Zen, uh, this helps us um, to suspend judgment. So the idea that you look at something without immediately jumping to some kind of conclusion of what you are actually seeing here. This is very much the, at the core of, uh, of Zen. And this is very different from uh, how we perceive um, the idea of good and bad, of figure and ground, of black and, uh, of black and white, of uh, positive and negative. Um, I picked out one example from, from Star Wars where you have all the stormtroopers in white and you have uh, you suddenly have Darth Vader in black. So the idea that you have something that is very positive um, and something that is very negative uh, and it all is mixed together. This is very prevalent in, in, our, um, in our society, in our culture. And it gets even more confusing, more dizzying uh, in later parts of Star Wars when you suddenly have a, uh, a black person uh, appearing in this white stormtrooper. Uh, uniform. So just by looking at these images, it, we find it, I immediately find it very hard to suspend my judgment when I see something that is black and white. So Zen is an emptiness full of possibilities, like a promise yet to be fulfilled. So this is the idea of Ma, of the pause. Um, Ma is about the silence between the notes which make the music. So this is one concept. The other concept that we will be seeing with, with, uh, with her work is the idea of wabi-sabi, the idea that you have something um, that is not perfect, that is not unbroken, uh, that has wear and tear. So the team master Shen, Shen no Rikyo said, there are those who dislike a piece when it is even slightly damaged. Such an, such an attitude shows a complete lack of comprehension. 
So wabi-sabi is the idea that things that are worn, things that are broken and put back together again, um, this gives these, um, these things a new meaning. And we should not, uh, it is very important not to throw things away just because they are broken. Everything can be fixed. And but let's come back to uh, let's come back to Junjin Lee. Uh, she was born in 1961 in South Korea. Um, so she now lives and works in New York. Uh, she was um, she has um, a major in ceramics. So she was born and raised in Seoul, Korea. Uh, but she also has a major in photography, uh, which comes from New York, and. Looking at these two influences, you see uh, how she mixes these two influences in her work. She was raised, uh, she actually learned calligraphy. So the idea that you paint signs uh, with a brush, uh, she learned this like on this. And here you see uh, what this, uh, how she prepares, uh, how she prepares her images. So she is using something that is called liquid light. So it's a painted on a uh, photographic emulsion that you can paint on paper. So this is actually how she applies uh, the photo emulsion to her images before she exposes them to the negative. So she then goes on to re-photographing this image and putting it into Photoshop. So there she, uh, you get the, uh, the idea that is very technical and very modern, uh, her approach, although she, uh, she blends these very traditional approach with very modern approaches here. Um, but here in this brush that she's using now to prepare her photos, you see her origins as a, callig uh, as a calligrapher. So the other major influence was uh, that she lived in New York. And when she did this major in photography, she was actually uh, working as an assistant for Robert Frank. And Robert Frank at that time, that was way past, it was in the 90s. So it was very much removed from uh, his early days uh, with the Americans. So he has been moving to uh, Mabu in Nova Scotia. And he was photographing there. And these are the kind of photographs that he that he has been doing there. So this is uh, very different from what he did in the in the uh, in the Americans. This is much slower. This is much more oriented towards the landscape. Um, a lot of people do not know that, but he just continued photographing even after the Americans. Although we um, are very used to only knowing uh, his work from the Americans. But this is the kind of stuff he did. Uh, he did when uh, Jun Jin Lee worked, uh, worked with him. So it's a very different approach. And you see, you see here that he has already moved on from, uh, from his approaches that uh, he used in the Americans. He also uh, painted a lot on, the, uh, on his pictures there. So this is the other influence here. And of course he did, uh, his, his later work was um, published by, by Steidel afterwards. So he never stopped, he never stopped working until the end. Um, so looking at these influences, um, Eugenia Perry uh, on, said on one of the, um, the works by uh, Jun Jin Li, um, it's about, her work is about viewing ordinary things, love, change, tolerate absolute incomprehensibility, uh, contemplate the temporal, recognize the celestial. So these are the concepts of that. And she's been very active. She has a, a whole lot of um, publications. We will only look at three of them today. And with that, let's jump into the, Let's jump into the book here. The first book I will be talking about is uh, is Echo. Echo is um, a museum catalog. Um, I try to find out how her um, how her works, how her publications come into life. Uh, from what I gathered, a lot of these uh, publications come out of um, museum exhibitions. 
her work as i said it is very manual uh, i think sheila and anya see you have both been in the in the museum and have seen the actual prints so they are huge if you look at them uh, and she's very interested in this in this material aspect of that so um the books always come out of these exhibitions and echo is uh, a summary of a lot of these works that she has been doing and it brings uh, a retrospective exhibition together uh, these are the works that you see here it starts with on road which is again a nod to robert frank it's not on the road like um the Kerak introduction to the Americans, but it's on road, which is uh, both a nod to Robert Frank, but also um, a voice that comes into and starts coming into her own. She has been working in the American desert. Uh, she has been dealing with her with her heritage with this pagodas project. Um, she's been doing these wabi sabi sinks, dealing with sinks, but also with uh, things like the wind. And if you look at her work, um, here, this, this, this is the early, this is the earliest work uh, that she did. This is on road. So these are random encounters that she did, random things that she's seen. And she always continues with this very material side of, of the, uh, of the composition and of the image. Um, here, this is one picture that I did not understand when I when I saw this the first time, but you will understand it when you have been to a, a, a monastery in um, in Korea. These are views from outside, from inside the monastery to the outside. At least it was my interpretation. Um, not a great fan. Uh, just to have some some critique here, I'm not a great fan of this here because I really never uh, really know uh, where goes what. So this is now two. This is American Desert, I guess. Um, so here you see the first, uh, the very few instances where she has uh, fragments of uh, of humans in there, and she contrasts humans with uh, the landscape. But again, here you always uh, you again see this idea that she um, combines the materiality of the print together, and she has this this flow that she has in these images here. So this is three. This is again American Desert. The things she photographs are very ordinary. It's rocks, it's um, desert. But let me go very close here to make sure that you see that. Um, in these pictures, you see her process. Uh, her process is applying uh, the emulsion onto this paper here, where you see the edges of the paper here. So part of this is, so this image is, a mix of her being in the field, being in the American desert and taking a photo, but then taking the negative home and working with the negative and applying uh, his her own um, work of her hand and connecting in the dark room with this picture again. So and all of these um, faults, these imperfections, this again is where the Vavitavi comes in, the, the imperfection that you see here, like this uh, things that are, you have to stay close here, otherwise you think it's a, um, it's a fault here. So here you see faults in the, in the negative and these faults that you see here on top of here, this is not a perfect image, but these imperfections become part of her work here. And so the work of her hand is always present in, in how she constructs these, uh, these images, you know, these negatives. Let me 
jump to to this one. So again, I have to look it up because here the title is always missing. This is seven. This is actually where wind starts. So this is a different approach to um, to the idea of making the 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 work that she does in the dark room, the work with the actual print uh, to bring this to make this part of the picture. So here she exposes the whole paper, but she only paints the emulsion uh, onto a part of the paper. So we see here these torn out, uh, this is painted on edges. And this is an interesting choice to, to paint it like, uh, to, to make the book like this in this kind of fold out that produces a way you can hang it in, uh, on the wall in an exhibition. Okay, so this is this is wind. So here again, you have the idea that you that what you are talking about is something that you cannot see. It is the wind, but you do not see the actual wind. You only see uh, what the wind does, uh, moving the clouds or not moving these these tents. Um, the temporality is also important here. So here. This is a very interesting picture to see um, that these that you see the wind working on these trees for a long, long time, because these trees grow into this direction because the wind blows them in this direction. So this is a picture um, of about I don't know how old these trees are, but about uh, a couple of. Uh, 50 or 60 years uh, of wind developed in this in this uh, in this picture here. Um, again, a different take on the uh, on the idea of wind. Here you have an absence of wind with these clouds that have not been yet been moved here. But again, here this darkness and light figure and ground and how everything shifts from one to another is reappearing. It has some very nice um, um, essays here in the middle that explain a little bit about her background, about her process. And let's come to the idea of things. So uh, things are important because they age and they accumulate um, the touch of the human hand here. Um, so here this again, this is a reference to her, uh, to the heritage, uh, to her heritage and to the idea that things that accumulate wear and tear um, are important. And her way of printing is very interesting because it, you, she also loses a lot of uh, information here. So you cannot um, you cannot decipher uh, a lot of stuff here. So it's pure form. It's pure black and white. It's pure figure and ground. So there's not a lot of texture. In and here this becomes even more pronounced. So this the way she photographed it from the actual thing, uh, there's only a fragment that remained. It's only a very tiny part. And this part here, this left part, this gap, this pause here, suddenly becomes a very important part of this picture. So again here, you see her roots of calligraphy over all over the place here. So this is uh, the smudges of the brush with which she applied the emulsion here. So this is echoes, which I find interesting because it shows 
the uh, it, it starts with showing the many topics she she covers here. Um, and let's come to the the second book. Um, this is Unnamed Road, and Unnamed Road. Um, this is the reason why I put this um, this um, picture by Luc de la Haye in here. So this is a commissioned work that she did in uh, the West Bank and Israel. So she was invited together with uh, 12 other photographers to come to Israel uh, and to come to the West Bank to photograph there. And let's start at the, let's start at the end here. Um, let me, let me read you the, uh, the end word here. Uh, making pictures in Israel and Palestine was above all an emotional challenge. My photographs usually deal with something eternal in the landscape, and it's, but in this place, the layers of history and conflict, fear and hostility frustrated my camera. I happen to travel a lot in the West Bank, not for any political purpose, but because I like the landscape between the cities. I try to gaze at the land without prejudice or judgment. I didn't want to deal with the masks of the people and I didn't want to put on my own mask. I wanted to see it as the olive tree sees. But I felt overwhelmed by the realities around me. I felt sad and uncomfortable much of the time and I found myself trying to make photographs in a place I didn't want to be. It was difficult, but looking back, I can see that it forced me to change as an artist and I'm grateful for that. On my final trip, I was able to see not only the land, but my own mind with its e uneven terrain and movements and to touch something elemental. So from now with, with the ongoing conflict in Gaza, we now know we are acutely aware of how troubled the land is that she visited there. And I wanted to, to talk about this book because I found it amazing um, that she almost failed to make photographs there, that she was so um, touched by this by this place that her practice started to uh, started to be in jeopardy here. Um, and still she managed to make these pictures that suspend any judgment that just look as she said look like an olive tree and an olive tree does not judge the things that it sees it just looks at things and she made these kinds of very quiet very silent photograph where all conflict is just hinted at but you don't see it because you don't see people there you don't see people fighting you don't see um, people taking a position there. And she also doesn't take a position in this conflict. She just looks at it. Um, and she looks at the same things that she looked in the American desert, which is um, a less loaded place, less a place where uh, that is quieter of these conflicts. In uh, the West Bank and in uh, Israel, these conflicts are much more um, acute, much more aware. You, can, you will be much more aware when you visit it. Um, so even if these pictures do not directly show it, they have all this quality of hinting at it so eventually she makes some more direct pictures like this um because this is just what is there this um, barbed wire it's just present everywhere and this is the olive, olive tree that she's talking about There are some of these very direct images here, but again, she takes herself, uh, she takes a step back. She doesn't judge, she, she just looks at things. Here 
here in this picture, uh, this idea of things that are destroyed and are worn down takes on a different meaning. So I, uh, this is why I find this is afterwards so so compelling to see that she is usually she is drawn to these kinds of things, but there is a different meaning to this. So this is uh, a ruin of a house. So and in this part of the world where she photographed, this takes on a different meaning than just time taking its toll here. And she makes these kinds of pictures that show you uh, the how you cannot, uh, how unsolvable sometimes these situations are uh, with this road that just doesn't go anywhere. It just ends in the middle of nowhere. And here the barbed wire reappears. So this is an interesting book because although she is not a she is not a conflict photographer, there is no way that she can avoid this conflict. And she finds a very quiet, still way of, of talking about this conflict. And even when People eventually appear here. Um, this is one of the um, one of the, the the picture that are so quiet and so um, distant that it is almost heartbreaking to look at this this kid that is just sitting there and playing in the desert. But this is the way she puts people into, in, into her photographs by using them as, um, as flat objects in, his, in her composition here. This is what um, is meant by her temporality. So uh, a lot of her pictures are, are about different time frames. Uh, the tree that gets bent over time with the wind, uh, the people that have lived here and have died here, and have become part of uh, have part, become part of the country. All of her pictures are about time and how it passes through this uh, this land. So this is, although it is a it is a book that has not been it is not a current book. This is from, uh, I think, from 2012, when she did the pictures. Uh, it has become an, an eerie, uh, it has amassed an eerie actuality right now. And let's end on this here. And I will not show you a lot of pictures in here. I will just show you the, the different sizes. So these are different books, different sizes. This has a lot of text. It has an essay. This just has an introductory text here that talks about uh, the, the setup of the project and her feelings towards um, Gaza and um, towards the West Bank and um, Israel and her photographing there. And this book doesn't have uh, any text at all. It just says voice. It just sums up um, the work that she's been doing over the years. And here we come, uh, the idea of painting to shadow, painting with shadows comes to full circle because here she just quite literally just paints with shadows. It's nothing else but a shadow here. And this is really, Beautiful book with a beautiful binding here. And it's wonderful because it's big. And I'm really jealous on Sheila and Anya that you have been to the exhibition and seen them with their enormous size. But here you get a glimpse on how this feels when you have this in your hand and you see the uh, the sheer size of this uh, of these prints. Um, 
these photos, if you if you just take them uh, one by another, so this is the uh, this is the oldest work and this is the newest work. You can see some kind of progress, and the progress, interestingly, comes with a loss of information. So she needs from the first book, which starts with a very clear picture in the beginning, she now just needs a few distributions of um, shadow and light and not even a lot of light here to make a picture. So her way of photography has been, has reduced even more. This is, just to, to have some critique here, uh, this is in parts very beautifully printed, like this one. So this is a very dark black and you see, you actually see the texture of the paper that she put the emulsion on so you can actually zoom in here and get a feel for, for the original paper. Um, so this is in terms very beautifully printed, but there are some pictures in here where her way of photography just seems to break down. And, um, where things are, let me show you, just quickly show you what I mean with that. Uh, where her way of uh, photography and the way it is printed here just starts to break down. It gets really over sharp sometimes. So, so a lot of these pictures are very beautiful. Some pictures just look like they have been, um, they do not really tolerate this kind of printing very good. Um, so she continues her theme of um, encounters with, with landscape, of uh, seeing without judgment. And she continues the theme of the pause. So interestingly enough, I find these, there are these pictures, uh, there are these, these gaps in here where you just have um, black pages. There is nothing on here. And I find this very beautiful because it gives you a pause. It doesn't really come out here, but it's really just pitch black. So there's nothing on these pictures. And this gives you a moment to pause. And then she goes from this, from this gap, it, it works like a palette cleanser. So this is one theme, a palette cleanser. And then she, she starts with another scene. And this looks like um, there is nothing on the, there's only crisscrossing on the page, but if you go very close, you can see uh, the, you can see the brushwork here. And again, this is a very interesting take on this, this idea of figure ground, because you cannot, uh, the further you go away from these pictures, uh, the further the idea of what is the figure and what is the ground here, uh, the further it gets distorted. And she works with this in the sequencing by introducing more and more structure here. But again, this, this idea of no judgment, uh, this expands to her uh, to her composition. She doesn't have a judgment on where is the center of the image. It's a very even image. So if you look at that here, There is no center here for the composition. It's just an even crisscrossing of uh, of brushwork, and this just goes on in her in her composition. And this is one of the pictures where I said, "Okay, I see her. I think uh, her way of photography and the way it is printed is starting to break down." So this, to me, looks a little bit over sharpened. Um, but, but again, yeah, very simple, very simple photography, very simple shapes, and yet very powerful. And you see what is happening here, that she's um, using photography like a language to say a word and to use this compositional word 
in different to, to talk about different things, about round things here and about triangle things. And then she goes on to something like this, which is just ooh, where you see that the image itself doesn't have any any um any markings on the negative itself. So this is just the, the texture of the paper that she prints on. So she uses her photography not only to talk about nature, but to talk about her own processing. And let me just quickly jump to this, because this is one of the pictures where I think, um, what a bold move to put, um, to leave the center of your image completely void. So there's nothing in here. So this is just about this pause here in the middle, this void here that you see here. And this is, for me, this is the, the core of what is meant with this ma, with this idea that the pause between two notes here uh, is just as important as the notes themselves. Sometimes she's she's doing a little bit more variation. This is one of the pictures where she has where we actually see some uh, some animal life or at least remains of animal life, which gives the whole um, the whole picture a little bit more rhythm here. But you again see this idea of the road, this traversing of nature, and eventually you come to pictures like this that are just shadow painting. So for her, I think we should not talk about photography, but we should talk actually talk about skiography because her shadows are um, almost more important than her light is. She puts in here some some of the pictures that she uh, she did in the American desert. But this is a different take if you compare it to her uh, her first images where she is always, you always see something in the desert. You always see pictures like this where you see the texture of the cactus. Now she's bolder. So now she, uh, she is um, very expressive in just saying, okay, here's a shadow and there's nothing else. And I am just, I flipped through this very fast here, but this just makes you want to flip very, very slow and go through this very slow because you become very quiet when you do that. And this is one of my favorite pictures here because it's so incredibly simple. And let me end on this because this is all I have for you today. Thank you so much, Stefan. Very beautiful. Um, I have a technical question regarding the last book you showed, uh, because I have never touched this book myself. What's the paper like? Because her work, uh, when you see it in a, when you see original works in a gallery or museum, the paper is so extremely beautiful. And I find it must be very challenging to reproduce these images in a printed mm -hmm. book. It is a glossy paper. It is coated. It is very glossy. And I think you need the glossiness because she has these very dark pictures. And if you uh, paint this on a mud uncoated picture, you will probably, you will be able to, to, to do this here where there is no texture in here whatsoever, but you will not be able to, to actually see this. This will probably just be pitch black. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a little bit gets lost here. A little bit of this feeling gets lost because it's very uh, shiny, glossy, even. And I already mentioned that there are some pictures in here where this, um, like this one here, uh, where this uh, seems to this this method of printing and this method of dealing with a negative starting to break down. So this is um, 
not really uh, this is not really beautifully printed i think from for me it's overly sharp and it loses a lot of texture so you do not see a lot of texture of the of the underlying paper in here so it just is very um looks look, looks a little bit over sharp so it's it's a challenge I, I think it's a challenging process to put her actual prints uh into a book yeah for sure and I think they, they they did a good job here. I think some of them, um, I think this this is printed. I hear this it is an uncoated paper. So this is just to give you a comparison here. This is an uncoated paper, but here it works better because she is um, in this, which is her most yeah you can almost say journalistic work. Um, here she is more um, um, the pictures are brighter so they are not as reduced as the pictures in uh, in voice so it is you, you do not lose so much when you paint that on an uncoated paper here but it's it's a challenge yeah all right, Glenn. Yeah, I'm trying to understand. Hi, Stefan. Um, Hi, Glenn. It seems as if she's working so hard with surface and she adds this emulsion and she takes great, pays great attention to the surface and the texture mm -hmm. of the images. And then the last few you showed us, um, I understand it's a challenge, but it looks as if she's using the focus in a different way. They're very focused and it's glossy. And it's almost like the message there is not so much about wear and tear and emulsion, but using the subject almost in a cal like calligraphy, it becomes its own texture. I don't know if I'm making sense, but it's, initially it was this wear and tear, the wabi-sabi mm -hmm. idea, but the last few, as you, you're right, they're very, very different, high contrast, but very sharp. But this what is holding it together is it her love of surface um i think in these it's the composition so it's the she is extremely reduced here um and i think in this in this reduction you do not necessarily need the um need this texture anymore because she's throwing away almost every information in the picture. Um, like, if you look at this, um, it would be nice to have some structure here, but even if you look at the, uh, if you look at the actual print, I would suspect that there is nothing here. It's just black. So there is no structure left. So she is um, reducing, she's reducing herself compositionally much more in this work than she did in previous works so if you if you if you look at this she started out like this so which is very close to an actual picture here with mm -hmm. defined uh with things you can define with, with defined outlines almost no uh discernible texture here it's very it's a very clear picture here and here this is super reduced and I think this emulsion phase in the middle, I think this is um, much more important for, for this work. Um, oh, for this work. This is much more important for this uh, for this work than it is for the later work. Look at the cactus pictures here. Yeah, here for this one. Where, where this is all about uh, the idea that you see her hand, you see the work of her hand. So it's very, it's a very um, abstract expressionism way of making a photo, where you actually see the the emulsion and her hand applying the emulsion to it. Whereas here, a lot of this is gone. A lot of this is pure composition.
which is, yeah, when you look at this, this is almost, it's, it's almost she's returning to a point of, um, of zero image. There's not a lot, lot of image here left. It's just a smudge of, of light in the Any other question? Who would like to ask a question to Stefan? You know, actually, I, I was thinking with that later work, um, I think it could be interesting to see it printed on an uncoated uh, paper, just to see what would happen. I, I have a, a book from Void, uh, Mayflies, by Dimitri Bede. Uh, yeah. And that has huge prints that are mostly black and mm -hmm. uh, printed on uncoated paper. And it has a really nice, uh, really nice effect. It would be kind of curious to see uh, okay. what the difference would be uh, to see uh, the same image, uh, like in the last book you were showing, to see some of the same images printed on completely different uh, paper. Uh, I can understand why they'd go with um, a glossy mm -hmm. uh, paper for that kind of work, but it could also be interesting to uh, to see what would happen if they uh, made a completely different decision. That would be an interesting question to 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 take to Nasraeli Press if they actually tried that to yeah. try uh, to to print these picture on on uh, matte paper and see what happens how this looks. I have no idea. So Anya, on that note, you and you saw these in the gallery. Mm -hmm. How they they in the gallery? She must have had more control than a published book. How were they printed in the gallery? It was just like you would stand there and stare at them because they were so beautiful because of the texture of the paper. You know, it was just very. That's why I feel like it's it's almost difficult to look at them in book form because it's so different than what I saw in the gallery but you know I understand you want to make a book uh, but in the in the gallery it was just the texture was very important I feel the yeah. surface you know like you, you I had to like uh, control myself to not want to touch it <laughs> yeah I get that so. well this is there is a lot of to this uh, to this texture uh, uh, piece of paper is a three-dimensional object so you actually see uh the 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 creases and the surface it's it's not flat whereas when you print it it becomes totally flat you only have a uh so you only have a two-dimensional object here so it's a photo of a photo here when you see when you see this on top here and so when you look at it at print in a in a gallery in the paper uh, on on actual paper that she's been using, you always see this uh, the surface, the three dimensionality there. So it must be a different um, must make a different expression. It's hard to reproduce in in print, probably. Edward, do you want to read the question in the chat? Um. I'm not seeing a question in the chat. Um, oh, is it just a comment? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I feel that these images also fit into your class, uh, Stefan, of the everlasting landscape, ever-changing landscape. Yeah, yeah, sure, certainly. I think this is, a, it's an it's an interesting take on, on landscape because usually we're we're so um we always perceive landscape as as relationship to people so if you if you look at uh early landscape paintings you always have a city in the in the distance or you have a what in, what is in in germany called a rückenstück so a person uh, that you see from the back gazing into the into the landscape you always it's, it's always about this relationship between uh a humans between humans and the landscape and i find it very interesting because she tries to suspend this so she tries to take this uh this human aspect out of this like what she said look at the landscape like an olive tree without judgment without okay this is my land or 
your land. All right. Stefan, thank you so much. Last chance for questions. Okay. Thank Stefan, so when is the next photo book show? Uh, next month, probably. Okay, very good. We we will see what that will be about. I don't know yet. So, if you have suggestions forward. and if you have a book you want me to look at or you, that you stumbled across and that is exciting, I'm always looking for inspiration. <laughs>